on Rumble, on YouTube, on Blaze TV. I'm Dave Rubin, and welcome to another Friday Roundtable Extravaganza. Joining me today is the co-host of You Are Here on Blaze TV, my old buddy Elijah Schaefer, author of Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, Matt Ridley, and NFL player turned Army Ranger, turned U.S. Senate candidate in Arkansas, Jake Beckett. Guys, welcome to the Rubin Report. Great to be with you. Thank you. All right. It was a nutty week that we're closing up shop. Obviously, the Smollett story is the big one, uh, but we got to do some COVID stuff. And then I want to talk about the imaginary war that the neocons uh, seem to want to get us into involving Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but let's start with some COVID stuff, uh, because Matt, you just wrote a really excellent book about the origins of COVID. And we've just watched the definitions of everything change, phrases we used to say two weeks to flatten the curve, herd immunity that we don't talk about anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Here was uh, Anthony Fauci this week on the definition of being vaccinated. Is it a matter now of when, not if, the definition of fully vaccinated changes? You know, my own personal opinion, Kate, is what you said is correct. It's going to be a matter of when, not if. Matt. We're already changing the definition of fully vaccinated. It's not one shot. It's not two shot. Maybe it's a third booster, a fourth shot. Wrap your head in saran wrap. What's going on here? Well, I'm, I'm boost, boosted. I've had two vaccines and a boost and a booster. And, uh, uh, you know, the, it does help. There's no question about it. Um, uh, the, the, the evidence that it uh, at least lessens the significance of I mean, the virulence of, of a, an outbreak is, is there. Um, but you're right. This moving of goalposts is, is a real issue. And the, the changing of, of the names and the rules and everything. And let's remember, it's now two years since the first known case, pretty well today, actually, uh, in that market in Wuhan in December 2019. Two years into this pandemic, we're still struggling to escape from it. Uh, it's done terrible damage to the world economy. It's killed millions of people. It's caused a an outbreak of authoritarianism like I thought I'd never see in my lifetime, even in Western countries. And we don't really know where it came from. That's what our book is about, trying to understand. And, uh, you know, frankly, there have been cover-ups, there have been obfuscation, there's been a blockage of information. It's disgraceful. You know, we ought to know, so that we can stop this happening again, exactly how this started. To that point, Elijah, I know you and I are pretty aligned on this stuff. I mean, do you trust any of these guys anymore? Okay, now the FDA says this, the NIH says this, you know, Pfizer says this, and then it just gets repeated on corporate media? No, yeah, I, I don't trust these people. Obviously, if your viewers aren't familiar, my background is in specifically genetic engineering and molecular biology, specifically in immunological delivery systems like this. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've worked with these kinds of systems in the vaccine uh, obviously, again, like if, if I was older, if I was over 60 and I had a comorbidities, I might take the vaccine. If I'm under 45, I just wouldn't take it. And that's, that's the problem with this is that there is absolutely no evidentiary truth to anything that the WHO or the CDC continues to put out. In fact, the WHO and the CDC can't even align on basic tenets of who is most benefited by the vaccine. And that's the problem is that if, if they had come out and just said, hey, look, if you've got two to four comorbidities and you're over 30 years old, or if you've got one to three and you're over 55, here's how many shots you should take. And if you're over 65, maybe get the boosters. But no, they're, they're trying to inject this into infants. They're even testing and, and, and trying to say, how low can we go? How much money can we make? And like uh, your, you know, just like uh, your other guest just said, you know, I have to ask myself the question, if this is about science, if this is about um, protecting the public, why are we using science uh, as a noun and not as a verb, as in the science is settled, not science as a discipline of continual understanding? And why, if it's about science, is it leading to authoritarianism and lockdowns? I believe it's fully nefarious. And I think that you know, where, where the pandemic began or started, I think it started from the lab in, in Wuhan. YouTube says it didn't, but uh, that's, that's up to them. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Matt jump back in on that since he just wrote a book about the whole thing. But Jake, uh, you're running for Senate in Arkansas. You mentioned right when we jumped on before we started the live stream, the things are pretty good in Arkansas. 
how much of this, the creeping authoritarianism, the state's rights stuff, the inability for the federal government to manage this at any level whatsoever, how much of this is all playing into why you're getting into politics? Well, it plays a, large, plays a large part because, you know, I've seen how we have ceded our our liberty as as free citizens of a constitutional republic to an unaccountable scientific elite, as President Dwight Eisenhower so presciently warned us of in his 1960 farewell address. It's hard to believe that was over 61 years ago, but we're seeing those consequences happen today right now. And, and I think Elijah is exactly right. Look, these these bureaucrats, these these so-called elites, they have no idea how to manage this virus. The only way through this is to continue to live our lives. There's no way that we can really mitigate the risk through continual injections of these vaccines. I think it's clear that that big pharma and the government are working hand in hand to essentially get every citizen of the United States on a, a never ending cycle of vaccine after vaccine after vaccine. We saw the announcement today, the uh, the governor of New York. Uh, just put in more tyrannical mandates yep. on businesses all across her state, either mandate vaccines or there's a mask mandate uh, inside private businesses. It's totally out of control. It's Orwellian. And that's one of the reasons why I'm running for U.S. Senate is because the leaders, even in the Republican Party, who we've sent to you know protect us from government overreach, have simply not done their job. We have to have real conservative warriors, pro-liberty warriors who can defend the free, free citizens of this country who are still upset and want to fight back against this tyranny. Right, you're speaking my language, man. And you know, if you want to, you mentioned New York, if you want to know how stupid it is here in LA, my producer mentioned to me that he went to see Kanye last night in LA, 90,000 people. Uh, and yet you still have to wear a mask if you go to the supermarket here in Los Angeles. So none of it makes any sense. Uh, but Matt, let me back up to you for a second. Cause on this, on the origins of COVID, which is what your book is all about. There was this weird thing online where for basically a year, there were a lot of people saying, you know, maybe this did kind of come out of the Wuhan lab and let's talk about it. A lot of people were banned or silenced or deboosted, shadow banned, whatever it might be. Then John Stewart goes on, was it Colbert, I think? And basically says, hey, maybe it's real. And then next thing you know, mainstream media can kind of talk about it. But now we're not talking about it again. We seem to have left. So, so what's going on here? Yeah, you're, you're dead right. There was an appalling, appalling attempt to censor away the possibility that this was um, a laboratory origin virus. Um, you know, th there's a there's a lab in Wuhan, which is the leading lab in the world by a mile for researching bat born coronaviruses, SARS like coronaviruses. And uh, it, it's produced hundreds of papers. It's collected tens of thousands of samples of viruses from all over southern China and neighboring countries. Uh, these come from a long way away from Wuhan. They don't come from the neighborhood mm -hmm. of Wuhan. They've been doing an immense amount of research. They've published work showing that they've hybridized and ch made chimera viruses, manipulated these viruses, inserted genes into them, um, uh, done th put, ex put them into uh, uh, humanized mice and human cells in the lab to test them. Th there's a massive Massive program going on nowhere else but Wuhan, and then suddenly, in the at the end of 2019, uh, a disease caused by one of these viruses breaks out in Wuhan. And at first, everyone says, "Well, it must be the market." People have said, "Well, then it turns out they've tested tens of thousands of animals in in and around China, and they haven't found a single one carrying this virus." So. You know, prima facie, you've got to take seriously the possibility that this came out of a laboratory. Now, we don't claim in our book that we know the answer, but we do show very strong evidence as to why we now lean towards um, a lab leak as an explanation. And as you say, we've spent 18 months being told that that's a nutty conspiracy theory that shouldn't be allowed in, in mainstream media. Uh, and, you know, why? Why should we mm -hmm. censor a perfectly reasonable scientific discussion of this kind? Uh, and it's it's happening again. I mean, you know, they're trying to shut down our book, basically, you know, by uh, trying to make sure it gets bad reviews and doesn't get on air. And this is a this is a really important topic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to make sure that the link to the book is in the description so people can check it out uh, without algorithmic manipulation although who knows what they're doing to this show. Um, Elijah, in terms of the media ever getting to the bottom of this, like, should we just not even pretend that these people are gonna try at this point? 
Yeah, we shouldn't. I mean, Dave, to, to kind of put this into perspective, a funny story is a buddy of mine just called me last night and he got diagnosed with the Omicron, the faded virus that Uh-oh. we all need to lock down over uh, out in L.A. And uh, I asked him, well, where did you get this from? He's not vaccinated. He had the uh, notorious alpha variant um, that was out there that we all, you know, were, were locked down over. Uh, I believe less people were dying around the same time last year. It, you know, it depends on what week you're talking about. But anyway, uh, you know, I was like, where'd you get it from? He's like, well, I had the alpha variant and I got this. It's real mild. Doesn't matter. I got it from a girl who's actually uh, gotten all of her vaccines and never got the uh, <laughs> the course. virus. She 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 had she and she all she basically got COVID only twice, but after she got the uh, vaccines. Then I just say, oh, you know what? This is so effed up. This is so screwed up, man. I mean, you're you're telling me that it's the it's the unvaccinated that are da- a danger, but you got it from the vaccinated girl, and her symptoms are stronger than yours. And I don't think the media has any interest of telling that story. Luckily, people like you and your show, I'm able to tell that story here. I just think that the media is, a, is an extension of the authoritarian, paramilitary, medical, tyrannical. Uh, uh, arm of the world right now, which is, you know, use this pandemic as a means, uh, whether they caused it intentionally, unintentionally, I don't know. Uh, but they're using this to get their way. And, you know, Don Lemon, you know, if he doesn't get fired for his misconduct, he, does, he doesn't want to tell America the truth. The mm-hmm. Young Turks, they're, they, make, they have a business model out of lying intentionally. And then any other media, including this one, if we're trying to tell the truth, the big tech companies come into play and they say, well, if you tell too much of the truth, then we're going to, you know, we're going to mess with you. We're going to screw with you. We'll delete you. We'll demonetize you. There's no merit to tell the truth. Luckily, people like you are taking the risk by having guests like this on. Uh, but I don't think, I think if people want to know the truth, you should read, you know, like the book on the show that's there. You should actually do your own research because the legacy media is here to delude you and to keep you under control. And we've got to, we've got to dump it. And luckily I'll just end with this is that people are dumping the, the, the corporate media. Yep. Nobody's really watching it anymore. Yeah, Elijah, are you telling me that we shouldn't trust Don Lemon, who was vacationing in Florida a couple of weeks ago after telling us that everyone there is dying? I'm, I'm shocked. Jake, as a former NFL player and uh, an army soldier and a young person, obviously fit, like, can you believe that they are trying to push this on absolutely everybody and that they just don't care? And that when they give you the numbers, I mean, the thing that I do on every Monday show after Fauci just spouts his nonsense on every Sunday show is that I talk about how on the, on the Sunday shows, he never gives you numbers. Oh, it went up 20%, but that's not a number. We need to know, okay, well, did it go from four to six people? Like, what are we actually talking about here? What are the ages? What are the comorbidities, et cetera? It just, none of it translates anymore. I think what we're witnessing right right now is the death in real time of journalistic and scientific rigor. And it's important to note that because traditionally journalism and science have gone against the establishment, right? They've always spoken truth to power. They've always been questioning the status quo. But now it's really dangerous and and totalitarian in many ways because now mainstream corporate journalism and mainstream quote unquote science are now aligned with the powers that be. Uh, The the big government, the Unibrow Party in Washington, the mainstream press, pretty much every major, uh, major American institution, all of our colleges and universities, look, everything is really aligned together in unison. And every time you see that throughout history, whether it be in the Soviet Union and communist China, that has not turned out well for liberty Mm -hmm. of free citizens. And so that's that's really the existential fight that we're in right now. I think, unfortunately, we have too many politicians, even in the Republican Party, who don't understand the nature of that fight. And that's part of the reason why I left the military to run for office is because that's where the battle is. That's where the fight is. And to me, the stakes could not be higher. Well said. All right, let's move on to the to the next story, which is the big one of the week, this uh, Jesse Smollett verdict. Unless you've been in, living under a rock, you know what happened here, but let me lead, read a little bit from the New York Post. Uh, Jesse Smollett was convicted Thursday of staging a hate crime nearly three years after he claimed two Trump-loving bigots beat him up, tied a noose around his neck, and doused him in bleach in a misbegotten bid to raise his public profile. The defense vehemently maintained Smollett was the victim of a real hate crime and called the brothers sophisticated liars and criminals who later offered to recant their story and tell the truth in exchange for $2 million. Um, Before you guys jump in, there were a whole bunch of tweets that are flying all over the Twitter sphere uh, from Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. So let's just put up a couple of them. I'm not gonna read all of them, but Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, 
AOC. These are tweets from roughly three years ago where they all are saying this is proof that America is racist. Uh, homophobia and racism have no place in our streets or hearts. Um, Kamala Harris, this is a modern attempted day lynching. She still has not deleted it. AOC, this attack was not possibly homophobic. It was a racist and homophobic attack. Um, and you know, Bernie with the usual stuff about surging hostility towards proof, uh, towards minorities around the world. None of them have, as far as I know at this point, deleted these tweets. Obviously Joe Biden is not the one handling his own phone, but I'm pretty sure the others do. Ah, Bernie doesn't either, but I'll give AOC and Kamala credit. Maybe they tweet for themselves. Um, Elijah, I mean, I'm sort of asking you the same question I asked you in the previous one, but it's like the media is not gonna hold these people to account, so they can just keep lying, right? They're just gonna keep lying. We know they're lying. They know we know they're lying, and they're gonna keep lying. Yeah, I'm trying not to laugh because <laughs> take this situation, and uh, these are some of the loudest voices about um, uh, uh, you know, alleged atrocities and problems in the world. Now apply their absolute inaccuracy and their inability to admit they were wrong to everything else. Apply it to the pandemic, apply it to January uh, 6th riot, apply it to uh, you know Charlottesville, uh, apply it to anything that we never stop hearing about mm -hmm. today. Climate change, right? I mean, these are the people that said we're gonna die in 12 years. And it's like, they're so quick to push narrative that they don't care about the truth. And then when the truth shows their narrative was wrong, Lucky for them, they're, I don't even know, maybe, maybe they crawled out of hell itself. I don't know where they came <laughs> from, but, but, but these people just, in, they're, they're intentionally aligning with the forces that are against us, the elites, uh, you know, the banks, the media, uh, you know, the, the uh, institutions of education. They're all corrupted and they're all working together for this globalist regime that cares nothing about, about what's real or what's uh, true. I mean, these people support 72 genders. Um, they believe men can be women. I mean, these are all falsities and basic premises. And I just think that when you look at this, you, this is when people need to wake up and realize how many more times do these people need to be proven wrong yeah. and fail to admit that, that wrong before you realize they might be lying about everything else. About literally everything else. I mean, Smollett, Brett Kavanaugh is a serial rapist, the Covington kids, Kyle Rittenhouse, <laughs> very fine people on both sides. I mean, I cover this, all this nonsense uh, every week. I wanna read a quote, I wanna read a quote though from uh, BLM and Jake, then I'll throw it to you, because this is pretty extraordinary. This is right before the verdict, what BLM said. So let's be clear, we love everybody in our community. We can never believe police, especially the CPD over Jesse Smollett, a black man who has been courageously present, visible, and vocal in the struggle for black freedom. Now, what's extraordinary about that is that after the verdict came out, they have now said, uh, the leader of Black Lives Matter has said that they stand by those statements. Jake, <laughs> there's just nothing we can do to get through to these people, right? Uh -huh. It doesn't matter. Well, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. They, uh, they, uh, they chained themselves to the sinking ship, you know, as it was going down, you know, into the Atlantic, um, which is kind of hilarious. But, you know, we, we can't really expect accountability from these people because I think it's important for everyone to understand these are not journalists who are making good faith, honest mistakes. OK, this is all intentional. They are pushing a narrative. They're trying to move the needle further and further left. They're working hand in hand with radical left politicians. There's been all kinds of reporting on how some of these late night talk show hosts talk with Democrat politicians. That, that's, that's all on purpose. And so I think what's important going forward is we have to find a way, you know, through our political uh, leadership and culture to you know, put some more skin in the game for these journalists who are totally out of control. Mm -hmm. It, not to go too deep down the rabbit hole, but I think it's important for everyone to note that there was a real turning point in our media's history in this country in the mid 60s with a, a Supreme Court decision called New York Times v. Sullivan, mm -hmm. which raised the standard so astronomically high for corporate media to be held liable for um, libel and defamation. And, you know, because if you look through history, politicians, I mean, Winston Churchill sued like 30 different publications over his long political career for uh, libel and defamation. It was kind of a tit for tat. It happened here in America too. And it kept the journalist relatively in check because they knew they could be held liable for civil damages if they got too out of control. With that New York Times v. Sullivan case, that standard got way too high for, uh, for actual malice, for defamation and libel. And so no one has any skin in the game. They're unable to be held to account and so they print and say whatever they want on TV with no accountability, with no consequences. And when there's no consequences, this is never going to change. 
So in Congress, you know, we can either, uh, encourage the Supreme Court to overturn that decision. There's kind of a, a legal movement through conservative legal circles to get that decision overturned. But also in Congress, we can send real leaders to Washington who can get that decision overturned via legislation. That's a, it's a hallmark priority for me. Yeah, you know, I get it. The New York Times versus Sullivan thing, it's like you want a high bar because you want to defend free speech. And yet maybe it's gone so crazy that now they feel they can do anything. For example, the president of the United States uh, calling Kyle Rittenhouse a white supremacist. Kyle, by the way, was on uh, with Elijah a couple days ago. So if you guys haven't seen that, check it out. Uh, Matt, I'm always fascinated how this stuff leaks into other countries. So uh, you're in the UK, obviously, uh, but these things don't stay within our borders in America. W what do you think the, the take is in the UK right now? Or what's your take? Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're watching that, that case with, with a lot of interest. And actually it reminds me of a, of a story we tell in our book, um, there's a, the, the Chinese state media started quoting a Swiss uh, molecular biologist, a virologist, uh, at great length, again and again and again. And he was very, very critical of America, uh, very critical of anybody who thought that this virus started from a laboratory. Uh, and he's, he's all over Chinese state media. And then the Swiss embassy in Beijing said, hang on, this guy, Wilson Edwards, a virologist in Switzerland, We've checked. He doesn't exist. Huh. Right. And he only appeared on Facebook uh, a, a couple of months ago. Um, can you please explain, Chinese government, did you make him up? Well, he disappeared from Facebook very soon afterwards. He's never been heard of since. You don't he say. was clearly a fake, fake account. Um, you know, but that's a government doing this kind of thing. And uh, I'm sorry, but, you know, where did it get the idea? I'm afraid there's a lot of it around. Yeah, and it's it's spreading in a way that is sometimes worse than the COVID virus, I would say, the mind virus around all of the misinformation. Uh, all right, let's move on to the third story. So the, the sort of missing story of the week is that uh, Russia and Ukraine might go to war or something to that effect, and it's being cheered on by an awful lot of people who make all the wrong decisions for the last probably three, four decades here in the United States. We've got some info from Fox News. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has the whole world anticipating his next move as he builds up a massive military presence along his country's border with Ukraine, with U.S. officials anticipating an imminent invasion early next year. Satellite imagery obtained by Fox News on Sunday highlights several locations within Western Russia, as well as one location in Crimea, where, the Rus where Russian tactical battle groups containing troops and equipment have been deployed. The plan involves extensive movement of 100 bat uh, battalion tactical groups with an estimated 175,000 personnel, along with armor, artillery, and equipment. Uh, Jake, uh, you were in the army. Uh, well, first, what do you make of, uh, of Putin's move, I suppose? But sort of secondly, from an American perspective, I was watching Tucker the last couple of days. It's like, we're hearing a lot of people like, oh, we've got to get in there and we've got to strike Russia and all this stuff. And it's like, what does that have to do with American interests with all due respect to Ukraine? Yeah, for, for, for those two points, first of all, I think this, this Russian aggression is directly due to the weakness of Joe Biden and his administration. I spoke about that during the Afghanistan debacle. I think this is a direct result uh, of what happened in Afghanistan. I, I said at the time it was bigger than that withdrawal. It was just the overall incompetence uh, it was clear that the Russians and the Chinese were going to test Joe Biden in his in the first year of his presidency. He's being tested. And he's being found wanting. You know, we can uh, revert these sanctions. We can reimpose these sanctions rather on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, and introduce more economic sanctions on Russia to stop this incursion into Ukraine. But I think your second point there is even more important because, look, we have to understand the history here. This is not Soviet Union, USSR, circa 1947. Mm -hmm. OK, this is not Joseph Stalin who is threatening to conquer Western Europe. OK, we can be reasonable here. Um, you know, we can display American strength without threatening World War Three or nuclear attacks. OK, you want to be unpredictable um, in your tactics and your strategy from a military perspective, but we should not be reckless. But I think that the key point here is to uh, identify the weakness of President Biden and his administration. This is all due to him. We saw uh, American strength being projected both domestically and internationally under President Trump. I know because I served in the Army as an entry officer. I deployed to Iraq under President Trump. We were feared, we were respected, and now we are absolutely disrespected and dishonored. Yeah, the point on Biden's weakness and after Afghanistan is a good one because it's like Putin knows he's got a lot of leeway right now. Elijah, are you amazed that, uh, well, I know your answer, unfortunately, that they're gonna trot out the same people 
who got us into Iraq, the same speechwriters, the same cast of characters who screwed everything up with no remorse. They're going to trot them all out again, and they're going to say why we have to get into some kind of war. Yeah, I think it's interesting here. This is where the uh, establishment and the government, the neocons, and of course the war-hungry uh, Democrats, they're kind of the same thing. I mean, when you look at who they're getting funded by and big tech, you look where their donors are, <clears throat> even some of them with the same uh, you know, donors to their super PACs, it's amazing how when we've uh, inflated the economy, Dave, you know this, we inflated the economy, our currency is down, and I think we're up for a good old war. I mean, what's the cost, right? Just uh, the men and women of our country, uh, young boys, young girls dying, getting blown up, uh, you know, billions, trillions possibly of dollars uh, of damage to the world economy, to uh, property. But hey, you know, it serves the interest of a few people who are powerful. It doesn't do anything for our country, but you know, if they want it, Dave, and we're only a republic, right? We're only voting people in to represent us. So, I mean, I mean, maybe one day they'll actually actually represent us and do something for us. But I mean, as you know, as a vet is on here and realizing that these are real men, this is real women on both sides of the aisle, whether they're enemies or not. We're not. We don't need another war. I, I, you know, the pandemic's slowing down. People aren't buying the climate change BS. Uh, you know, we're we're still here, stuck in a hole. You know, trying to get ourselves out the supply chain. And if this is really what these global players are trying to do, God help us, because this is. If, if Biden gets us into another war, there's not. A, there's a lot of adult words that I won't say on a live stream that I would like to say to these people. And I pray to God that he spares us from another another atrocity like this. Afghanistan, Iraq were too much. We're finally out and to an extent to, to, the, to the severity. And if this Ukraine-Russia thing blows over, this is simply due to incompetence, if not nefarious actions for the people that are controlling Joe Biden. Elijah, you ask too much that our elected officials represent <laughs> us. I'm gonna have to make note of that. I'm gonna send a strongly worded letter to somebody over in DC. Uh, Matt, as the, as the non-American sitting here, what, what role do you think the United States is supposed to play in these world affairs? I think often, I do think sometimes, I mean, I don't know about often anymore, but I think sometimes our intentions are good and then there's always mission creep. Sometimes the intentions are not good. Sometimes you've got, you know, speech writers like David Frum, you know, telling Bush to get us into Iraq. So that's what we do. What, what do you think the role of the U.S. should be broadly? Yeah, well, we, we in Europe have benefited from American protection for 60 or 70 years, and it's fantastic what's been done to, to help keep the peace, particularly when the Soviet Union was a threat. But I think Jake's right. It's not about military now. Uh, there is a dangerous uh, uh, world as a result of American weakness. Uh, and uh, it's not just Ukraine uh, threatened by Putin, but it's Taiwan threatened by uh, uh, Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. It's what happened in Hong Kong and the fact that we didn't respond. I think we have to find other ways of responding to this and making it clear to regimes like Beijing and Moscow that their behavior is unacceptable without going to war with them, which would, as you have all said, uh, not be uh, a productive way of, uh, of reacting. I think that's the final word on this Friday show. We've all agreed to not go to war. I think that's kind of, <laughs> let's not go to war. You know, how about that? How about we defend our own borders rather than Ukraine? Dave, how about that? I will, Hell take, yeah. I will take that as well. Uh, Matt, Elijah, Jake, I thank you guys. Uh, Matt and Jake, obviously your first time on. You're welcome back anytime. Elijah, you know you're welcome back anytime as well. Uh, I'm going to finish up for a few minutes without you, but thanks guys and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. All right, people, uh, I felt good about that Friday show. Not trying to make you hysterical, just trying to give you some straight up information, maybe expose some of the nonsense, some of the hypocrites and the frauds and all of that stuff. And I think uh, we accomplished that. Uh, are we making sure that Matt's book is linked down below, right? Because you know what happens anytime someone puts out a roughly controversial book or not even controversial, if you put out a book or a video, you guys all know this. If you put out anything, in essence, that goes against the narrative, you get hit by the Reddit trolls and everything else to ruin your reviews and all of that stuff. Uh, so Matt's book is linked uh, right down below. And on that note, uh, it's almost the weekend. I hope you had a good week. I, I feel sharp. I feel like the show is good this week. I feel like we're, we're in a nice little groove. Uh, as I've been hinting to you guys, we got a major announcement on Monday. Uh, depending on timing, it will either be announced during our live stream 
uh, our normal show, our normal live stream at 11 a.m. Pacific on Monday. If not, perhaps a little bit later in the day, uh, somewhere else, not on this channel, perhaps. We're working out some stuff. Um, I sense some of you may know what's going on here, you know? Uh, and that being said, you want to, anything else about the Kanye concert I can tell the good people? 90,000 people. 90, 90, just really understand what's going on here in Los Angeles. 90,000 people, it was at the Coliseum. Yeah, the Coliseum in Los Angeles. I've never been there, but it's a pretty massive place. 90,000 people dancing, they dance, do people dance to Kanye, it's, you dance? So they're dancing to the Kanye, no masks he's telling me, which obviously is fine with us, that's just fine. Um, did they check? They checked passports and like all the nonsense, okay, whatever. Um, so that's happening in LA, while at the same time, if I would like to go to the supermarket down the street right now, which I don't go to anymore, I send people because I can't take it anymore. Uh, if I wanted to go to the supermarket to get some orange juice, I would be have to put on a mask and I'd most likely be yelled at and belittled by a you know stock boy. So <laughs> anyway, have a great weekend, everybody. We're back on Monday. It's, it's a big week next week, I promise you. And I hope uh, you enjoy yourselves and eat good food and drink good wine this weekend. And that's it. Okay, see ya.